Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives. As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. The purpose of marriage is to reveal the relationship of Christ and his church. The purpose of marriage is to reveal the glorious relationship, the relationship of Christ and and his church. Marriage is intended by God to paint a picture of an ultimate reality, an ultimate relationship. It paints a picture every day, every moment, every interaction is a brushstroke, and the picture is designed to represent Christ and his bride, the people of God, the church. That's the ultimate point of this passage in Scripture. And as I said, we, we, we just feel like the, the richness here theologically and then the abundance of application for us personally and in light of our culture is, is so much. We want to look this week at what we might call the theological backbone of this culture, of this passage rather. We, we want to look primarily at the relationship of Christ and the church that forms the, the model or the original, you might say, for the application that Paul derives about wives and husbands. So this week we're going to accent what this passage says about Christ and the church. Because the reality is, if we, if we don't love the original, we're not going to paint the picture very effectively. If we don't delight in the original, we're not going to paint a very accurate picture. We, we might actually see this passage as just kind of a, an arbitrary decision about roles and duties and responsibilities. But Paul's heart in this passage is to, to reveal a, a glorious depiction of a relationship planned by God in eternity, brought into fruition in history, culminated in eternity that our everyday lives paint a reflection of. That's, that's what Paul's heart is. So we're going to spend this week focusing on, on that original relationship, that model, that prototype, and next week, we'll accent more the applications that flow out of it. I was talking to my daughter who likes to paint. She got some artistic genes uh, that did not come from Lori or me, um, but skipped us and came from her grandmothers, I think. Um, but she likes art. And, and so she was telling me recently she was, she was drawing some profiles of family members. I won't reveal who they are, but profiles of family members. And she was saying, you know, it's interesting. Uh, you don't really see things until you look closely. <laughs> I didn't want to ask too many more questions. <laughs> you don't really see things until you, until you look closely. And she was meaning you, you see little features that you didn't notice before. You notice, actually, this person's chin is a little different than that person's chin. And there's this little facial feature. And you don't really see things until you look closely. And obviously, the point is you can't really paint things unless you look closely. 
we cannot paint a right marriage unless we look closely at Christ and his church. We can't do it. We can't paint marriage rightly, either as singles in just our view of marriage or as married couples in our actual marriage, unless we look closely. And the good news is, the subject that we get to look closely at is the most glorious subject in Scripture. It's Jesus Christ himself, and the particular role he plays is the most glorious role in Scripture, that of Savior and head of his church. So that's what we're looking at closely this morning. We're going to look at what this passage says. Now, there's, there's three emphases or accents uh, theologically about the role of Christ in the church that are drawn out of this passage to, to allow Paul to make the exhortations he does uh, to wives and husbands. First is the headship of Christ for the church. The headship of Christ for the church. You notice in verse 22, Paul makes this exhortation to wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of, of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. As the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Now, the theological point Paul's making about Christ here is that he is the head of the church. This is a, a, a bodily metaphor that Paul uses in Ephesians and elsewhere, where he, he describes head as this, this kind of a governing and provisional authority. Obviously, they didn't have quite the scientific knowledge that we did back then, so the head would have been seen as both a nourishing and a governing uh, role in the body. Would have been what the head was. It provided it. It was sort of a, a a an authority, a preeminent authority over the body, and and so what Paul is saying here is Christ operates in that way toward His church. The church is under the lordship of Christ. It sees Christ as her King, as her authority, as her Lord. Now, an important caveat here, because I know the, the exhortation here is to wives to submit to husbands. Very important ca caveat. Christ is in a category all his own. All right? So no, no human authority has the kind of absolute authority over his domain that Christ has over the church. At, at best, the marriage picture is that. It's a picture. And we would never think of a picture as the same as the real thing. You don't dive in to a picture of an ocean. You don't climb a picture of a mountain. It's, it's supposed to represent it. It's not supposed to be it. All right? Important to distinguish. So wives do not worship their husbands as though he were Christ. Right? Important to distinguish. The point here is there's an ultimate picture, an, an unrepeatable picture, that's reflected in a human way in this relationship. So just an important caveat here. But we, we again, we have to, to value the relationship of Christ and his role as head over the church to even paint our human picture. Christ is the head of the church. The church must relate to Christ as her authority. She must look to him with respect and honor and submission to his loving leadership. We had a, a new members exploration class yesterday, and I was talking to some people exploring membership in the church. I was just saying how, how valuable it is for the church to be able to declare Christ is our head. Christ is our authority. He decides the direction and vision of this church. His word is our, our, our ruling, governing word. He, he, he is the one we, we look to, we esteem. Our, our lives are lived in, in reverence to him. The church honors Christ as her head. The church has no alternative head but Christ. The church doesn't set up different kinds of heads of which Christ is one. The church looks to Christ and says, Christ alone is our authority. That's Christ and the church. Now, again, important to point out here, the application is that a wife should paint a picture of this headship of Christ over the church in the way that she submits to her husband. The, the word there has, has a, a, an idea of, of willingly coming under the authority of someone else. Commentators uh, take great pains to point out this is not a forced submission. 
This is not something that the husband demands of his wife or forces from his wife. This, this kind of, of submission is not based on any, uh, any uh, inferiority from the wife. It is a, a willing desire to paint in her role a picture of the way Christ should be related to by the church because the church is under the headship of Christ. Now, husbands, it should not be difficult to understand why this is a challenging scripture for wives to read because you and I are less similar to Christ than any painting is to any real-world scenario. There is a greater gap, and there is no painting that is as inaccurate as me representing Christ. I mean, there is nothing that bad in the world of painting, okay? So it is not difficult to understand why wives could look at this passage and find it challenging. It's also not difficult to see why the culture finds this passage offensive. This is perhaps one of the most culturally offensive passages in the scriptures. Let me say that again. I believe this is one of the most culturally offensive passages in the scriptures. We need to be aware of that. It's not difficult to see why. I think there's a couple of reasons. First of all, men don't lead like Christ very often. And so it is not difficult to see why it is difficult for wives to relate to their husbands in a way that reflects the relationship towards Christ, since their husbands don't look like Christ very much. And the second reason is a more spiritual reason. Behind the dislike of this passage is the dislike of the original. The reality is the culture doesn't like the fact that Christ is the authority over all things. So, of course, they don't like the picture of that authority. Now, it's easier to focus on the picture than it is to focus on the original. But, but really, the antagonism is ultimately towards God. God has authority over the world. Christ has authority over the church. People are not free to do whatever they want. They are bound under the authority of Jesus Christ. Christians are redeemed. That means they are possessed by their king. They are claimed by their king. Now, that is the most countercultural statement that could be made. So I think those two reasons explain why. Why is this culture, why is this passage so difficult, so offensive to the culture? So we have to be, be real about this. In preaching and receiving this passage, we are revealing ourselves to be a counterculture. Let's be realistic. This passage simply can't be accommodated to the culture. And I, I think, frankly, we have to get to more used to this kind of thing happening in the Scripture. We're, we're going to increasingly bump into passages that aren't just difficult to understand or odd to the culture. They're going to seem offensive and dangerous to the culture, like this passage does. To be a Christian increasingly in our country is no longer simply to be awed or preferential towards a certain religion. Increasingly, it's going to be to be offensive and dangerous. Somebody was asking me not long ago, how do you think we relate to the topic of sexuality in a culture that just finds our beliefs outrageous? I said, you know what, honestly, I, I think we're, we've just really become good at not talking about how outrageous we really are. And we have to get a little better at, actually, I'm, I'm, I was telling somebody, how would you respond? I'd say, actually, I would say, I'm crazier than you think I am. You think I'm crazy for this? Let me tell you what also I believe. I, I, I believe that the humankind was actually destroyed in a flood. I actually believe that. I actually believe that there was a real man that actually rose from the dead without any medical aid. No, no shock panels, no epinephrine, nothing. He just rose from the, I actually believe that. I don't just believe it like in the you know, religious sense. That's heartwarming. I, I physically believe that happened. I believe there will be a resurrection from the dead. 
where every human being will rise out of their graves with reformed bodies and face a God you can't see and live forever without death. I believe that. I'm way crazier than you think I am. You think I'm crazy because I just believe some weird archaic notions about sexuality and sexual purity and human roles and marriage. Oh, no, I, I'm way crazier than that. Trust me. You haven't begun to explore how weird I am in your real point of reference. We better get used to that. I, I think this, this is a culturally offensive passage because the culture has happened to narrow in on this category of, of roles and God gets to decide how we serve him. But the reality is we're crazier than they think we are. A wife is called to reflect somehow the relationship of the church towards Christ with a, a subordination, a, a willing servanthood, a, a deference. The passage references fear. It could be reverence, a willingness to submit. Now, the only reason she does that, listen carefully, the only reason she does that in this passage is because of her love for Christ and her desire to see the relationship of Christ to the church displayed in the world. That is the reason given. Some caveats. Husbands are not Christ. They do not save their wives. I think that's why Paul says, is himself its savior, to distinguish between the original and the picture. He is himself its savior. They do not save their wives. They should not receive worship in the way that Christ does as our God and King. It is also important that women are not called here to submit to all men as their heads, nor are they ever called, listen, here's a distinguish, distinguishing point, to sin against Christ in seeking to submit to their husbands. Never called to do that. Husbands don't become Christ so that their word is law, even if it calls a woman to sin. Second important point to make, this passage does not command, listen to this, husbands to enforce their headship but rather to love their wives. The submission of the wife is her free response to the authority of God in her life and her reverence for Christ, not due to the forced demands of her husband. There's nothing in the Bible that calls for or commends a man who demands or forces his wife to submit. The submission that she offers is obedience to the authority of God's word, not to the emotional or physical demands of her husband doesn't make it any less culturally offensive, but it does at least point out this is a, a willing response to God and his word, not a cultural response to the demand of a husband. Third important point, this passage no way indicates a lesser intelligence or value of the woman as God's image bearer. It is tragic in our culture that a role of authority is equated with greater value. It is tragic in our culture that a role of authority is equated with greater value, greater competency, greater intelligence, greater emotional capacity. It is tragic in our culture that is the case. It is not the case. This is not true in the Trinity, in which the Father has a role of authority, but does not have greater value than the Son. It is not true with adults and children in which parents have authority, but not greater value or worth than their children. And it is not the case with wives who have equal standing in Christ, equal dignity before God, equal potential in the kingdom of God, equal responsibility to live for God's glory as their husbands. The calling here is to paint a picture of an unrepeatable relationship, but one that can be imperfectly reflected as the wife relates to her husband in submission. Brian Chappell, the commentator, says this, Christian responsibilities vary. Their value does not. To conclude otherwise is to reason that Christ becomes inferior in the Godhead when he submits himself to the Father, though Jesus proves himself to be equal with God, or that the Spirit deserves less glory because he performs the purposes of the Son by his Trinitarian nature, our God has made it abundantly clear that an equality of value does not require an identity of roles. Very, very crucial distinction. 
one illustration that imperfectly makes this point. Because I, I, I know, because I know myself, and I know my brothers here and their imperfections, and I can just imagine, and I have heard, why I say it is, it is difficult to respect, in the biblical sense, a man that I am having trouble respecting in terms of his weaknesses and sins. How do I respect what is not always respectable? Very understandable challenge. How do I respect what is not always respectable? An illustration that I think could imperfectly make a point. You, you've heard or seen or read, I'm sure, of how, for example, a, a, a Secret Service agent seeks to serve the office of the president. I'm sure you've seen that. Now, I don't believe that every Secret Service agent uh, votes for the president <laughs> that is in office. These guys have careers. They, they don't change every time a new president comes into the office. And I don't think likely they agree with every decision that person makes or even respect the man who is in the office, and yet their desire to serve is based on wanting to show deference for the office without reference in some ways to the person in the office. Well, there is a similarity here. A wife in her submission to her husband's leadership is not basing that on her current level of respect for her husband. Now, I pray her husband is respectable, and we'll get to that in a minute, but it's not really in reference to that. It's in reference to her view of the Lord Jesus Christ and her desire to paint that picture, to reverence that office, as it were, in her treatment of him. That's why Peter can say that wives, even of unbelieving husbands, can glorify God in their reverence for their unbelieving husbands and demonstrate a godliness that is simply profound, even if that man does not obey the word. Now, just like one more caveat here, because I know it could be on many people's minds. This is not an endorsement for wives to uh, endure a, a kind of physical abuse or any kind of extreme abuse in that regard. We would say there are other biblical passages that would say the church should seek to protect and guard the innocent. So we're not covering those kind of scenarios, okay? There's a place for protecting. That's not the kind of submission uh, in the form of that kind of ungodly, sinful abuse that I'm recommending here. I'm talking about the normal, everyday life when any husband who is selfish and imperfect does not live up to the standard of Christ, the wife cannot base her obedience to this passage on the godliness of her husband, rather on her love and desire to reveal, in the imperfect way, reveal the office of head that reflects the person of Christ. The love, the headship of Christ over the church is a privileged calling placed on every married woman to reveal. Second point about Christ and the church. The love of Christ for the church. The love of Christ for the church. This is by far the lengthiest section in this passage, and husbands should take great note of that. The number of verses... Uh, directed to them as compared to their wives, probably because they needed it more, um, but also because the standard, in my view, is even higher for them than it is for their wives. Husbands, verse 25 says, Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body extraordinary passage about the love of Christ for his church. Now, obviously, the exhortation is, husbands, love your wives. But this, I, I want to accent, as I said, the, the backbone of that, the foundation of that is 
love of Christ for his church. Christ loved the church, it says in, in verse 25. And then it explains that love using three primary themes. It says this love is sacrificial. It says that it intends her glorification, or we might say her ultimate good. And it says it is it is unrestrained. I struggled for a word there. It is unrestrained in the sense that because they are unified, he loves her as fully, as completely, as instinctively as he cares for his own body. It is, it's sacrificial because it says that Christ gave himself up for her. Now, this is one of the verses in the Bible that gets us to our primary theme as a church, the primary theme of the scriptures, the redemption of the church through the self-sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That This is the gospel in a phrase. He gave himself up for her. Why did he do that? Well, because the church is a collection of sinners who rebelled against God, who hated God, were under the judgment of God, were facing God's eternal wrath and had no way to make up for that sin. And then Christ comes into the picture as the only perfect righteous man, lives in their place, fulfilling the obedience they should have fulfilled, and then with no necessity on his own life, goes to the cross and takes the punishment that was intended for her on himself. He gave himself up for her. He laid down his rights and his glory and his magnificence in heaven. He laid aside the worship of heaven and, and he ate, as it were, the dust of earth. He laid aside the omnipotence of heaven to live in the weakness of human flesh. He laid aside the adoration of heaven and exchanged it for the, the scandal of the cross. He laid aside the, the affection that he had with his own father to experience and said God as judge towards sinner. He laid aside his, his sense of, of peaceful uh, rule and reign on the earth to be a place where he had, he had nowhere to lay his head. He laid aside his, his glory and honor of the angels to submit himself to the mockery of demons. This is what Christ did to save his bride. All the rights he had as God, he set aside in order to experience the full punishment that human beings deserve under God's holy judgment. This is Christ as head of the church. This is the kind of head he is. This is the definition of his headship. It is a head that is sorely wounded, as the hymn says. Full of grief, bowed down. It is the prince of sorrows, languishing under the veil of the sun and under the judgment of God and under the mockery of the very sinners he is pleading for on that cross expiring under God's judgment because there is no other way for his bride to be rescued. This is Christ, the husband of the church who offers himself willingly, sacrificially for the joy set before him of seeing her finally glorified, cleansed of all blemish, purified from her guilt and washed. I think that's a reference to her salvation. Washed with the water, with the word. I think that's a reference to the proclamation of the gospel that in a moment the sinner who is facing God's judgment, all that happens is they hear a word of the gospel and because of the payment of Christ, they are cleansed, they are sanctified and they now have a future of being presented glorified without spot or wrinkle or any such thing without blemish is the future of the bride who previously was only facing the anger of God over the defilement of her sin. This is Christ's love for the church. He goes further to say, Christ has decided to unite the church to himself in such a way that, that he treats her as his own body. So he uses this, this illustration of love that, that in, in normal human experience, people don't hate their own body. Now, he, he's not referencing extremes of self-mutilation. or He's talking about the normal human experience as an illustration here when he says this. 
No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes. It actually, the, the language there, nourish and cherish, uh, could be described of a, a, a mother taking care of a baby. <laughs> it struck me as funny this week to think he's, he's kind of saying, People baby their own bodies, okay? People baby them. I mean, you get a little owie on your foot, and you're concerned all day long. You're desperately concerned. I was reminded of, a, I've mentioned this story before, this embarrassing moment where my daughter had this cup, with a sippy cup with a little brutal sippy edge on the side. It was just ridiculous, and it fell full on my toe. And the excruciating agony that that was removed all vestige of manhood and courage from me, and I just laid on the couch, gazing in agony up into the ceiling for a few, and I thought, boy, that's kind of how we relate to our bodies. I am in pain right now. And I don't know about you, but we typically treat that quickly. It's not like, well, I'm in pain right now, but I'll think about that tomorrow. I have discovered that I have a headache, but I, I'll just think about the headache tomorrow. I'm hungry right now, and I haven't eaten anything for, I don't know, maybe like four hours. Uh, but you know what? I'll think about that next week. I'm really, really thirsty. But you know what? Water's so out of sight, out of mind. We'll deal with that next month. We don't do that at all. We're like, I need water now. I need something to drink now. I need a Starbucks now. I need food now. I need a Band-Aid now. I need antiseptic now. I need a doctor right now. I remember when I had an appendectomy. It's the only major surgery I've ever had. Uh, but it, it was, I remember going to the hospital. I wasn't sure what it was. And I, I got to the hospital. There's just pain. I just was in pain, so much pain. Not impressing you with my manliness, I realize. I was in so much pain, and this, and this thing is just hurting me. And I'm like, I don't know what this is. And I, and I remember that they gave me something to make me a little more lucid. And they came and they said, well, it's your appendix, and we're going to have to do surgery. I, I wanted to worship the Lord. I was like, I, thank you. Whatever it is, take it out and take me out with it, please. I want to be done. I want to be horizontal and sleeping, and I don't care what happens to me. If I wake up with fewer body parts, I don't care. I just take away the pain, and before you do that, put me to sleep, please. Paul says that's how Christ relates to his church. as if the king of heaven has ever had any needs, pains, sufferings in all of eternity past, vulnerabilities, uncertainties about the future, anxieties, little painful moments. And so he chose to link himself to the church in such a way that he feels her pains and griefs and sorrows and inconvenient difficulties in the same way that a person does the, the greatest extremity on their body. He's aware of it. That's why I think Paul heard when he was still persecuting the church, he heard from Jesus, why are you persecuting me? Why? Because Jesus nourishes and cherishes it and cares for it as in the same way that a person is aware of their own bodies and what, what needs they have. Brothers who are husbands, and any of you who want to be, this is what it means. means to paint a picture of this kind of love for our wives. This is what it means to be a husband. You notice in the passage that husbands are not called to exert headship over their wives, and wives are not called to demand love from their husbands. I don't think it's wise when there's been writing and teaching on this to say that marriage is essentially about a woman meeting a man's needs and a man meeting a woman's needs. I don't think that is what marriage is ultimately about. 
people. I think in his kindness, God allows that to happen as well. I think ultimately, marriage is about Jesus. It's about Christ and the church. Marriage is theological before it's personal. Marriage is eternal before it's applicational. Marriage is about Jesus and his church before it's about you and me. A husband doesn't love his wife so that she'll respect him. A husband loves his wife because he loves the Lord Jesus and wants to paint this picture as best as he can. Husbands, we are called to give ourselves up for her, for her ultimate good. We are not her savior. We can't create any glorification in her life, but I think the application is that our hearts are for their ultimate good without reference to our personal preference, our rights, our personal comfort or desires. It is about how can I display the same kind of sacrificial love that Jesus pursued in glorifying his own bride without reference to her merit? I mean, if there ever was a husband who loved an unmeritorious bride, it was Christ toward the church. If there ever was a husband who gave himself up without any sense of having an equal return, it was Christ. If there ever was a husband who didn't love out of some expectation that he would get something back, it was Christ. And that is the reason we're married. To paint that picture. How does this work out practically? I don't think the Bible spells it out exactly. We'll talk more about that next week. How, How does it Is it just always like, no, I will for you. No, I will for you. No, I'll do this. No, you do this. No, I'll take the trash. No, you take the trash. No, I want to submit to you. I want to love you. Well, I think that'd be closer. I think a race to accomplish our own purpose in the gospel would be closer. I think that's part of the reason Paul says this. No, I'm I'm supposed to love you. I'm supposed to submit to you. Let me stop doing. Let me. Would you stop serving so I can finally do something for you? Why don't you submit by letting me serve you? I think that'd be closer to what Paul has in mind. That's that's a good argument for a marriage to have. What a privilege, men and wives. What a privilege we have. It's not about each other how well we're equal in how we're doing. This is about the Lord. Brian Chappell, several quotes I want to read because they're just so good, one-liners. He says, a husband's love for his wife is intimately tied to his knowledge of Christ's love for us. Again, he says, we lead most clearly, most effectively, and listen, most authoritatively, most like Christ when we live most sacrificially. Finally, the path to Christian leadership in the home is always the way of the cross. Does this mean a a man never makes a decision that his wife disagrees with after faithful communication and wisdom and that she shouldn't submit to that decision well well, sure that happens but I think even in those decisions it better be sure that he's doing this for her good and for her well-being and for her protection and benefit and he is willingly sacrificing his own well-being and benefit in order to do her good that should be the, the normal flow of the Christian marriage Harold Honer says this, helpful for both of us, it says, it should be observed that as with the exhortation to the wives, so also here the subject is a free agent. Husbands are commanded to love their wives unconditionally, not only if the wives are submissive, rather husbands are to love their wives in obedience to the Lord and because of the example of Christ's love. It is not the duty of the wife to tell him to love her, It it is his duty to the Lord to love her. Final theological point I want to hit briefly. The union of Christ 
with the church. Paul starts talking about loving his wife of himself, and that just leads him to want to talk further, apparently, about this union and the, the incredible mystery of it. And he says, we are members of his body, so somehow two have become one. And then he goes back to Genesis, and he says, in Genesis it says, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And here's the shocker of the whole passage. Here's the shocker of the whole passage. He says, this mystery, the mystery that two shall become one, this mystery, two becoming one, is profound. And listen to this. And I am saying that it, that mystery described in Genesis about Adam and Eve, that mystery, it, it refers to Christ and the church. (laughs) Let's walk through what he just said. Two become one in Christ and the church. If you remember, God established that as a possibility in Genesis when he said, men and women, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one. Out of two, there becomes one, a mystery. And then he says, that mystery, two becoming one, revealed in every marriage, ultimately was pointing to something bigger than every marriage. It was pointing to the purpose of every marriage. The goal of every marriage was to paint the ultimate marriage, the ultimate mystery, that Christ, God the Son, could be united to rebellious humanity represented by the church, and the ultimate two could become one. So he's saying the purpose of marriage going all the way back to Genesis was to picture a mystery that would only finally and ultimately and in a culminating way be revealed in the union of Christ and the church. That they are no longer two, but one, distinct in their personhood, but united inseparably for eternity. Just as the union with Christ never ends, so this mystery is revealed as having the eternal mind of God to be displayed in every union of every marriage. Christ becomes the head of a human body And every marriage was intended to paint this picture. And this was God's intention, apparently. This was the hidden mystery in that quotation from Genesis when God told Adam, this is how it's going to work. A man shall leave his father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and something amazing is going to happen. Two shall become one. There was contained in that verse, as there often is in the Old Testament, more even than Adam could imagine. More glory even than Adam could possibly have anticipated. He's like, Let's, I, I think Eve's amazing. Uh, but God said, there's something even better than that. There's an even greater two becoming one that is to come. And every marriage just paints an imperfect picture of that great two becoming one, Christ becoming one with his church. Now, a husband does not condescend to become one with his wife in the way that Christ point here is not the condescension. Actually, most husbands I know marry up. I certainly did. Um, the wife condescends usually to marry the husband, in my experience. Uh, so the condescension is not the point here. The point here is the two becoming one mystery, okay? But of course, it's shocking that that two could become one because of who that two is. Christ, the Son of God, sinful humanity people of the church become one. No wonder Paul says this mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. And I love he, he used the word however, he says. However, it's almost like he has to, to descend back down from the glory of Christ and the church. He's saying, now, now, now however, the ultimate point of this is Christ and the church Keep your minds there. Keep your focus there. That's the ultimate purpose of this. However, back 
in ordinary land, everyday life, let each one of you love his wife as himself. And let the wife see that she respects her husband. Brothers and sisters, what this passage calls us to is to look closer at the gospel. Whether we're married or we know someone that's married, it calls us to look closer to the gospel so that we're more amazed when he says Christ is the head of the church and Christ gave himself up for her. To look closely at the gospel. If you're her and you don't know what I'm saying when I say the gospel, it just means this. Every human being is a sinner before God, but if you repent of your sins and you believe in Jesus that he died for your sins, you can be united to Jesus as your Savior as well. It's as simple as that. If you repent of your sins and you believe in Jesus that he died for your sins, you can be with God forever. That's the gospel. And it doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian, our job, and especially if I can appeal to husbands and wives, is to study, look closely at the gospel. You cannot have a faithful marriage unless you're looking at the gospel because the point of marriage is to paint the gospel. And unless you look closely, you'll miss things. To conclude here, let me just give you some, some resources and how you can look closely to the gospel. How do you look closely? What are some things you can read and study to look closely to the gospel, whether you're husband or wife? A couple of recommendations. I would say anything that Jerry Bridges ever wrote, he is at home with the Lord now, but anything he ever wrote, but especially I would recommend the gospel for real life and transforming grace. The gospel for real life and transforming grace. To look closely at the gospel. I would also, you can get all these on Amazon. I would also recommend The Gospel Primer by Milton Vincent. The Gospel Primer just looks at how the gospel applies to different aspects of Christian belief. The Gospel Primer by Milton Vincent. I would, if you're looking for an older book that's weathered the centuries, I would recommend The Glory of Christ by John Owen. Anything by John Owen would change your life, but that book is a masterpiece. You can get the smaller version, not the massive version. It'll do your soul good. The Glory of Christ by John Owen. I would recommend The Gospel-Centered Life by C.J. Mahaney. The Gospel-Centered Life by C.J. Mahaney. I also recommend The Cross by John Stott. The Cross by John Stott. Some scripture verses you might spend time devoting yourself to in a meditative way. Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, Psalm 103, Romans 5, Romans 8. Ephesians 2. Let me encourage all of us as a church. Look closely at the gospel. He gave himself up for her and became her head. Look closely so that we can marvel at his grace so that in our varying roles, we can paint that picture more accurately, one brushstroke at a time. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we delight in the gift that you are to your church, that you gave yourself up for us, that you care for and nourish us so graciously, so kindly every day. Lord, whether we're children, teenagers, singles, married, Lord, we, we pray we would look closely at this gospel.
we pray that if for those of us that are married, we, we would or we would paint this picture well. Pray that to be true for every marriage in our church, every future marriage represented by the people here. Pray. We thank you in Jesus' name.